You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Sarah McHugh, USLHS volunteer and tap room and events manager for Break Rock Brewing in Quincy, Massachusetts. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Jeremy. I'm excited to be back. Well, thank you for doing this. Today is October 9th, 2022, and this is episode 194 of Lighthearted. This is actually the first of a two-parter about Wood Island Light Station in Bitterford, Maine. Uh, and uh, these two episodes will be available both in the usual audio format and also in video form on the USLHS YouTube channel. So Sarah, uh, you and I had the pleasure of visiting Wood Island in late August, uh, and we shot some video there. So what was your impression? What do you think of Wood Island? I was pretty blown away by it. It was amazing from the boat ride over to getting to the island, walking the um, little boardwalk out there, and then finally mm -hmm. when it opens up and you get to the lighthouse at the end. Pretty incredible, that. And then, I mean, the inside of the lighthouse is, is pretty amazing as well, which, which we'll talk about in the rest yeah. of the episode. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a kind of place that uh, it's, it's uh, I'd say, kind of off the beaten path for most people. A lot of tourists who go through southern Maine don't necessarily get out there. It is uh, obviously on, a, on an island, requires a boat ride. Uh, but Wood Island, I would say, is one of the most beautiful and historic light stations uh, in New England, uh, certainly. Uh, and when you go, as you mentioned, when you go for a tour there, you take the boat from a place called Vines Landing in the village of Bitterford Pool, uh, which is part of the city of Bitterford. It's about a mile boat ride out to the island, and then you walk the boardwalk across the island. I think that's about a half mile from the uh, where you land the boat to the light station. Uh, it's, it's a really pretty walk, uh, wouldn't you say? Definitely, and I believe it's inside of a nature preserve, so the walk out there is kind of you're on this path, and everything around you is untouched um, by humans. It's just all nature. And then eventually you get to the end of it. And like I said, it, it opens up and there's the lighthouse and the water and it's pretty incredible. So Sarah, let's tell everyone a little bit more about the history of Wood Island uh, Light Station before we go to today's interview. Sure, Jeremy. Wood Island, which is about 35 acres in size, is about two miles east of the entrance to the Saco River and less than a mile from the village known as Biddeford Pool. The communities of Saco and Biddeford grew up on the banks of the Saco River and around Winter Harbor at the river's mouth. Textile mills grew into the chief local industry and fish and lumber were also major exports. Congress appropriated $5,000 for a lighthouse on Wood Island in March 1806 and the light began service in 1808. The 1808 tower lasted until 1839 when a new 44-foot conical rubblestone tower was built. The rotating light was 69 feet above mean high water. The lighthouse was extensively renovated and a fourth order Fresnel lens was installed around 1858. In 1873, Wood Island got its first fog signal, a bell with striking machinery housed in a pyramidal wooden tower. Keeper Thomas Orcutt's dog, Sailor, achieved widespread fame in the late 1800s and early 1900s because of his habit of pulling a rope with his teeth to sound the fog bell for every passing vessel. In 1970, 28 of the island's 35 acres were deeded to the Maine Audubon Society. Two years later, uh, the entire lantern room was removed from the lighthouse and a rotating arrow beacon was installed on top of the tower. The public complained about the, quote, headless lighthouse. So a new aluminum lantern was installed when the light was automated and de-staffed in 1986. In 2003, a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation called Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse was formed to care for the light station. The group has been working for a full restoration of the lighthouse tower, keeper's house, and other buildings. Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse, or FOWL, F-O-W-I-L, as it's known, uh, also takes care of the wooden boardwalk from the boathouse to the keeper's house and eight acres of land at the light station. In the summer season, boat tours are offered to the island and light station from Vines Landing in Bitterford Pool. Three people are included in today's interview. Brad Coop, a lawyer by trade, is one of the founders of Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse and served as its longtime chairperson. 
George Bruns is the current chairperson of Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse and a former commercial bank risk manager. The third person in the interview is Richard Parsons. Uh, Dick was a history and English teacher for 30 years. He serves as the historian of Friends of uh, Wood Island Lighthouse and his new book, Wood Island Lighthouse, uh, Stories from the Edge of the Sea, was published uh, this year by the History Press. Sarah, you took part in this interview. Uh, so we're going to hear approximately half of the interview today and the second half next week. So let's listen to part one now. I'm speaking this morning with three people associated with the Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse in Maine, uh, also known as FOWL, F-O-W-I-L. Uh, with us, we have George Bruins, who is the chairperson of the group, uh, Brad Coop, who is a former chairperson and longtime volunteer, and Dick Parsons, who is the group's historian and author of a new book, Wood Island Lighthouse, Stories from the Edge of the Sea. Uh, Dick, Brad, and George, thanks so much for being with me this morning. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to be here. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Thank you. And uh, before we get into the discussion, I also want to mention that with us uh, this morning is Sarah McHugh. Uh, Sarah and I visited Wood Island with George and Brad a couple of weeks ago. I believe it was August 30th. I've been on the island a few times. It's always a treat. It's a gorgeous place. It's always a pleasure to see uh, the, the great work being done by Fowl. Uh, so Sarah, how did you enjoy visiting uh, Wood Island for the first time? It was awesome. It was I didn't really know what to expect. I had looked at pictures of it, um, but just being there on the island, it was a perfect day to be out there. Um, it was pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did have an absolutely perfect day weather-wise and sea condition-wise and everything else. So it was, uh, it was a pretty special day. So glad you were able to, to join us for that, uh, Sarah. And thank you, George and, and Brad, for being part of that as well. So uh, let me get into the questions here. And before we talk about the lighthouse, which is obviously the main reason we're, we're talking today, uh, just maybe a little bit about yourself. First of all, let's start with Brad, who I've known for I don't know how many years. Brad and I, you and I have, have known each other uh, being on the board of the American Lighthouse Foundation together for, for years. Approximately um, 19 uh, I was going to say maybe 20 or pretty yeah. close to it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, could you tell us a little bit, Brad, about how the Friends of Wood Island Lighthouse came to be, how it was formed in the first place and how you uh, were personally involved with all that, how you became involved? Sure. As you know, uh, Jeremy, the Coast Guard has uh, long had a program where they could issue licenses to their properties uh, to groups, pro either uh, civic groups or, or, or uh, individual groups, ind individual people. And um, uh, that license authorizes the licensee to have access. It's a non-exclusive access to the lighthouse and uh, uh, should be distinguished really from what a lot of people tend to think of as a lease. We are not leaseholders. We don't have the capacity to keep the Coast Guard off the property. Um, and uh, we are simply given access for the privilege of uh, restoring and maintaining the lighthouse. And back in late 2002, the Coast Guard made a determination, uh, uh, given publicity about Wood Island as being on a doomsday list, uh, they issued a letter in to actually, the, in, in our case, to the city of Biddeford and said, is there an organization that could uh, or would um, take on that responsibility or be interested in it? I was at the Biddeford Pool Land Trust at that time and um, uh, expressed an interest. And uh, Anita was also, in a, in a, my wife, was also in a Biddeford Pool Improvement Association uh, capacity, which was solicited by the city to uh, consider this. So we wrote a letter to the Coast Guard and expressed our interest, and they wrote quickly back to say that uh, Tim Harrison at uh, 
the American Lighthouse Foundation was, and the American Lighthouse Foundation was applying, and I should contact them. So we did, and uh, a meeting was scheduled for February of 2003, where uh, another fellow who had also contacted ALF uh, by the name of Sean Murphy joined us, and uh, Tim and Tim, Sean and I we kind of put our heads together and said, well, maybe we could form a chapter and uh, we would uh, uh, schedule a meeting. And we did so, uh, a community meeting. And uh, uh, in on April 5th, 2003, we're at uh, a, a fine turnout came and uh, uh, we formed the chapter. I was elected chair and Sean was vice chair. And it took off from there. Okay. And to jump uh, to more recent history, George, how did you become involved and how did you end up uh, succeeding Brad as chair of the organization? Well, I was at that meeting in 2003. Um, I responded to a newspaper article saying, you know, we're going to have this meeting. And I went to that meeting and I've been uh, following the organization initially, uh, you know, I was a docent uh, in the first the first season of uh, of Lighthouse tours, and uh, eventually became secretary, then treasurer, and um, you know, and and I did a lot of training of docents and that sort of thing. And so, when Brad uh, asked for you know a, a, a succession program, I guess I won. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's slight hesitation there before the word one. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful organization and it's a lot of fun, uh, but it's a lot of work. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. And he has, he has uh, ascended to the position admirably. Uh, yes. Great, great, great uh, sort of rejuvenation and energy uh, of the organization in the past year. Yeah, well, I, I can see that. So you've both done a tremendous job. So moving on to, to Dick, I have a two-part question for you. How did you become involved with the Lighthouse organization, with Fowl, and how did you come to write your excellent book, which, uh, by the way, was uh, just published in May, I believe, officially. Uh, yeah. So how did, how did all that happen? Well, well I'll give a one part answer to your two part question. Okay. <laughs> uh, when I retired from Columbia University and moved to Maine, my, my daughter thought that I needed something to do to stay out of trouble. And she was um, a co worker with Sean Murphy's wife. And so the first thing that she suggested is that maybe I would like to get connected to the lighthouse. Now about the same time I was introduced to George, who in turn introduced me to Sherry Poftek. Mm -hmm. who is the um, historian and archivist at the time. And since the lighthouse had just been restored to its 1906 appearance, they were really looking for somebody to do some research and find out a little bit more about the keeper at that time. So Sherry thought that may be a good challenge for me. And, um, and it turns out that it was, and I enjoyed it a good deal. And as I began to find out more and more about Charles Burke, who was the keeper, um, I was curious about those keepers that both preceded and followed him, mm -hmm. and then became curious about the keepers that preceded and followed those guys. And over time, um, uh, all of those different stories kind of came together. And, and although it went through several different iterations, um, that's really the origin of the book and how it came to be. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the fact that the book is largely concentrated on the personalities, the keepers, the life at the station and that sort of thing. That's always, to me, the most interesting part. Well, it was for me, too. And I thought that um, I thought that there were a, a lot of lighthouse books that talked about the lighthouse. And what I really wanted to do was sort of examine the stories of the keepers that were there and what their what their experiences were like. And so I hope that this book may be a little bit different from some of the others out there. Yeah, well, I think it's a, it was a perfect strategy to, to take with that. So before we talk more uh, about the lighthouse, I want to mention, and let, before I ask this, this question, I I'll also say that the next uh, few questions I have relate to the history of the, the place and certainly Dick 
uh, you're the historian, so you might want to uh, take the lead on answering these, but certainly George and Brad are welcome to, to chime in as well on these. But before we talk about the lighthouse, just a little bit about another structure that you see on the way to and from Wood Island. You also see it from Vines Landing where the boat leaves for Wood Island. Uh, it's a very prominent structure. It's an old uh, day beacon, an unlighted uh, day marker or day beacon known as the Stage Island Monument. I believe it's almost 200 years old. Maybe just a little bit more about that because I know everybody who goes there wonders what is that thing there. Yeah, and it's oftentimes, I think, for, by visitors mistaken for the lighthouse itself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that story goes back to 1821 when a brig called the Hesper and its captain Stevens were trying to navigate in February through a snowstorm and mistook the passage between Wood Island and the little island that's right next to it, which is unfortunately called Negro Island, for the passage. And as he tried to get across the shallow ledge there, he went aground, um, lost his entire cargo and a good deal of damage to the vessel itself. Um, he later charged um, Edmund Blunt, who was the editor and owner of the Coast Pilot, which was sort of the navigational aid at the time, with, um, with poor instructions as to how to get into, um, into Biddeford Pool in Wood Island the winter harbor there. And so the two of them engaged in this bitter debate over the course of several years when finally the government decided to intervene and um, sponsor the building of, of the structure that you see today, which is, I think, mistakenly called a monument. It's not a monument to anything. It's really, a, as you say, it's a, it's a day mark, a, a buoy on land, really. Yeah. Um, but the, and that was, that was, um, completed in in 1825 but unfortunately there were some accidents that were involved during the building of the structure it collapsed and one of the builders a guy by the name of Lowell um, was killed and another uh, person Samuel Knight was seriously injured later widow Lowell um, took a petition to the government asking to be reimbursed because they had to rebuild that whole structure and it cost a good deal more than they had originally thought. So hmm. um, that petition was denied. And then in 1845, some 20 years later, Samuel Knight uh, petitioned uh, to, for a pension since he was working for the government and he had been so seriously injured, that petition was denied as well. Mm -hmm. So the structure continues to exist. And I don't know if uh, George or Brad have something to add to that. It is an interesting structure for sure, uh, and uh, thank you for filling in the detail on that. And as you mentioned, it's odd that it's called a monument, but there's also the Little Mark Island Monument up in Casco Bay, another very prominent day mark, which actually had eventually had a light put on top of it, uh -huh. so it's sort of a pseudo lighthouse, but I know that's also referred to as a monument, which is kind of strange. I don't know what they're a monument to, but anyway. Um, it still really serves a, a purpose because if you're if you're out there in the bay, it, the the land is is quite flat, and and uh, even with the houses and 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 other buildings along the the shore, it is almost impossible to see where the mouth of the Saco River is. Yeah, and so you aim for the day marker, and to to your right is the Saco River, and to your left is is uh, Biddeford Pool Harbor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, it's, so it still serves a purpose. So let's talk a little bit more about the human history of uh, the Wood Island Light Station. Uh, as we just talked about a few minutes ago, for years it was occupied by a, a resident keeper and family. It was a family light station. Uh, in the early days, would you say it was a, a pretty isolated, a, a kind of a rough place to live, would you say? I would, yeah. In fact, the first two keepers out there died on the island. Um, the first, a fellow by the name of Benjamin Cole, at one time wrote a letter, which we discovered at the National Archives, which, among other things, he says, I am completely destitute of a boat and consequently a closely confined prisoner to the island. Hmm. Gives you the impression of being isolated out there for sure. And he contracted what we think was probably tuberculosis in the fall 
He was only out there a year and um, was unable to get or receive any medical attention and was eventually um, was eventually passed away out there in December. Um, the second keeper's name was Philip Goldwith and Goldweight, and his son um, was would have been required to leave the island when he died because a new keeper had been uh, assigned there. But that um, that was not possible for him to do. So he was required to petition the government to be allowed to actually stay there for about six months until the spring rolled around and, and conditions improved. The interesting thing about your question though is it sort of suggests that those early years were the only years when there were when it was rough and, and um, isolated. But as recently as um, 1914, the keeper out there, or his, I'm sorry, the keeper's wife was hospitalized for nervous prostration, which is <laughs> like a nervous breakdown. And a keeper in the 1930 um, was reported in the newspaper um, in this way. It said, light keeper at Wood Island stricken with a nervous breakdown. So um, the conditions of isolation and um, those things that come along with it uh, were present well into the 20th century by the looks of things. Um, one, other, one other comment before we leave this topic, and that is in, uh, in 1870, um, Albert Norwood, the keeper out there, in a letter that we have, tried to, uh, well, he, he mentioned in, in his letter that he wanted to get to Saco and he couldn't the first time he was writing the letter and continuing that letter in another day or so said, I still can't get to Saco. And then the third day continued as he still couldn't get to Saco. So um, conditions um, could oftentimes, um, as Benjamin Cole say, create, um, create the feeling of being a prisoner out there. So I think the short answer to your question is yes. Sorry for yeah. long, longer. No, 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 not at all. And you're right. I'm, I'm sure it was a less isolated as time went on in the sense that you had uh, larger communities uh, close by, I would say, but yeah. certainly in the winter, especially. To, yes, to be, especially. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure there were long periods of time where it was impossible to get, get off the place. So, uh, Sarah, I want to bring you into the conversation in a moment here, but let me ask one more question uh, before before that, uh, what happened uh, around uh, Wood Island and Bitterford Pool during the War of 1812? I think it was pretty active uh, around uh -huh. there. Well, I, I'm not sure that it was really active. It, it was, it became active in 1814. Mm -hmm. That's when um, a British ship of the line called the Bulwark pulled up beside the island and um, discharged a group of, of Navy soldiers to, um, to, to, to make, basically make, make a raid on Bitterford Pool. Um, prior to discharging those soldiers though, the bulwark fired a number of cannonballs um, into Bitterford Pool and one of them went right over the little village and landed in the farm of uh, Samuel Tarbox. And that cannonball is now, it sits in the MacArthur Library. We still have the cannonballs. Kind of interesting little side tale. But the raid itself uh, created a good deal of damage. Several ships were burned, another was confiscated. Um, and the story, which I've, I've not been able to really ver verify, but I think probably is true, is that the one of the, the first lieutenant on the bulwark had a serious dispute with Thomas Cutts, who owned the store in Bitterford Pool and a lot of those ships and that the viciousness of the raid may have been the result of the of that conflict between those two guys it may have been as much personal as anything else following that there were a couple of other uh, privateers who made their way to the island and created some problems there but the interesting thing to me is that in uh, right after this raid in 1814 we do have a letter where the town fathers said that light out there is not doing anybody any good except the enemy. And so they decided to extinguish it for the remainder of the war. And they took 
anything that they could move and that was valuable all the way up to the falls just to keep it away from the enemy. And then one other thing, following the war in 1816, the keeper was arrested because he didn't pay the taxes that the town wanted to, wanted to collect um, from the lighthouse out there. And that, that sort of was a kind of a little, a small footnote to the whole business of the taxation problems of the nation around that time, trying to decide who's gonna pay what taxes and who's gonna collect them and, and so forth and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was, it was really more than just the raid itself, um, but that certainly was an interesting yeah. moment. Yeah. It kind of, it's, it's an example of uh, something a lot of us uh, talk about often, people are interested in lighthouses, that with the lighthouses can s serve as kind of a window into more general, into broader history. I think that- Well, exactly right, yep. One of the things Wood Island is known for, and one of my personal favorite favorite stories and things about it um, is a famous dog that in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s um, was, was living on Wood Island. Uh, the dog's name was Sailor and he lived at the light station with keeper Thomas Orcutt. So what was so special about Sailor the dog? Sailor has, is, uh, uh, is, is a favorite of ours and uh, all of our guests. And we sell Sailor t-shirts and Sailor mugs and that sort of thing. But Sailor, I, I was told once that, that Sailor actually belonged to, to Thomas Orcutt's son, but the dog uh, followed Thomas Henry Orcutt everywhere he went. The dog came from Berwick and and uh, ended up at the lighthouse. And somehow uh, uh, Henry Orcutt, you know, taught the the dog to ring the bell. Now the bell was in the bell tower, and uh, it had a striker mechanism, but it also had a, a rope pull that was outside the uh, uh, of the tower. And when the ship would go by. Um, the dog would run down and, and, and pull the bell. And, um, you know, this was, this was well known and people was written up in papers and that sort of thing. Well, um, supposedly one, one day the, uh, the ship went by, tooted its whistle and the dog did not ring the bell. And so the dog came back and Thomas Henry Orcutt said, you know, go, go ring the bell. And the dog left, but came back, came slinking back, and he was reprimanded once again. And so he went out and uh, came back with the bell rope in his mouth, and apparently it had parted. And oddly enough, the p photograph that we have of the dog ringing the bell seems to have a knot uh, where the bell rope may have parted. <laughs> and uh, a, a photograph was taken and has appeared in newspapers all around and including all over in London. Uh, and uh, so Sailor was, was quite famous. For me, a very funny thing happened one day. There was a dog on the beach and Sailor was an old Scotch collie. And uh, there was a dog on the beach wandering around by himself that looked exactly like Sailor. And I walked up off the beach and passed the, the little park that, where the bell is and there is this dog laying in front of the bell uh, yeah. on the ground. Uh, and I said, uh oh, you know, uh, this uh. is this is Sailor Reborn. <laughs> and I do have that picture of, of uh, the dog laying in front of the bell. Yeah. So Sailor, Sailor was so famous that he got his own obituary um, when he died. Um, and not only that, but uh, Waldo Barrel, who was uh, um, grandson of one of our keepers and uh, nephew of another uh, wrote a poem and I just it's a long poem so I'm not gonna read the whole thing but here's the way it goes poor sailor was a faithful dog on yonder isle of wood through many years of rain and fog nearby his duty stood but faithful master's noble dog and none could him excel for 15 years in storm and fog when asked he'd ring the bell with our island friends, we sympathize to whom this loss befell. For sailors gone, the pet so wise, the dog that rang the bell. <laughs> Something I did when I got home after visiting Wood Island, that story stuck with me so much. And I loved all the photos that are at the lighthouse of Sailor. 
So I did a Google search, grabbed that photo, and I actually framed it. I was, I forgot that I did that, but it's sitting right next to me. I put it in a little frame because I love the picture of him ringing the bell, and it does have the the knot in the middle of it, um, as you've mentioned. So pretty Excellent. cool. <laughs> so my follow-up question to that would be, is the bell that's on display at Vines Landing the same fog bell that was associated with Sailor the Dog? I'm guessing it's not. The reason I do that is that I understand Sailor was brought to the island when he was about two months old in 1890. And it was 1890 that the bell that's down at the, uh, at the uh, uh, landing was taken off in 1890. So I doubt that he learned to ring it when he was two months old. Okay. In any reasonable time thereafter. Yeah. I just wanted, I uh, was wondering about uh, clarifying that. I wasn't quite clear on that. So. The, the first document that we have that talks about him ringing the bell was in 1894. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be, it was amazing as it was, but to, for a two month old uh, puppy to, to pull a rope and ring a thousand pound <laughs> bell would be ordinary. So a 12, was it a 1200 pound bell? Whatever it was. Uh, He'd have I, been hanging by the rope. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, moving on, another uh, well-known story related to the human history of Wood Island is uh, the story of a keeper named Eben. I guess it was short for Ebenezer, uh, Eben or Eben Emerson was involved in a rescue in March uh, 1865. Could one of you uh, tell us what happened then? Yeah. Um, Keeper Emerson had gone up into the tower about one o'clock in the morning um, in March um, on a particularly brutal um, night and thought he heard human voices in the distance. Um, turns out um, that those were indeed human voices and a ship uh, named the Edith Ann had gone ashore um, on Washburn Ledge, of which about, um, oh, I don't know, about a um, quarter of a mile maybe uh, from Wood Island. So he immediately went down and, and got his rowboat and tried to make it out there and wasn't able to do that. And here's the part that, that is somewhat confusing to me and still a, a, um, still a, a goal of research is to and he, he, he got a neighbor to help him go out there. So the two of them were able to row out um, to this wreck. And I'm not sure who that neighbor was. Um, and I'll get back to him in just a second. But anyway, um, they were able to get out to the wreck and they found that the crew had all made it into a lifeboat that was still hanging from the davits of the, of the, um, uh, of the ship that had gone ashore. Somehow or other, Emerson had managed to get close enough that he was able to jump onto that Edith Ann, gave some instructions to the crew that was still in that lifeboat, told them that when he gave the word that they should cut the rope that was holding them um, on, the, on the boat. Then coming back to the lifeboat, um, not the lifeboat, but coming back to his rowboat, so the story goes, he heard some noises and went back into the um, ship itself and was able to rescue two hamsters. Now, I'm not real sure if that's um, about the veracity of that. But anyway, he managed after a good deal of time to jump back into his rowboat and they were able to get a rope from the rowboat back to the um, lifeboat on the ship. And at an appropriate time when a, a wave came that the uh, um, lifeboat could float on, he gave them the instructions and they cut the rope and they sure enough were able to, to save them. Now this we do know that on the way back, he was able to pull a couple of pigs into the boat and a couple of chickens as well. Wow. One thing that maybe those hamsters got a little confused with the pigs, but I'm not real clear <laughs> about all of But, um, uh, Eben Emerson, as a result, um, was commended by the British government. Um, the ship that he had saved was um, from Nova Scotia, from Digby, actually, Nova Scotia, um, and was awarded a pair of binoculars as a result, which his great, 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 I don't know how many greats descendant still has, and we had them on the, um, on the island for a while, but um, she now possesses them. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, yeah, that's, I think about as much as I know about that. 
Yeah. Well, ha yeah, hamsters are almost like miniature pigs in a way. I, I guess I could see how that confusion <laughs> might might happen. Two footnotes, if I may. Yeah. Uh, one is it's a wonderful story to tell from the tower because you can see Washburn Ledge, which is marked with a spindle that comes out of the water uh, just on the shore or just off the shore. And it sort of is vivid to give you an actual crash site uh, while you tell the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the second thing I forgot. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have forgotten it. I'll come back to it if I, if I remember it. Okay. Uh, so uh, moving on, are there uh, anything else, any notable, either notable? Oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Brad. I'll edit that together. So it'll flow very smoothly. So go ahead. Very good. Um, we first became aware of it uh, very early on. If it wasn't the first meeting, it was the second or third when this great, great granddaughter of uh, uh, Eben Emerson came to one of our meetings and she brought that rosewood box and the binoculars, uh, which we cover today, um, uh, uh, to us to see. And uh, she has been a, a, a wonderful contributor of artistic work uh, th throughout the years. Uh, we have a map of shipwrecks and such that she, mm -hmm. uh, she actually painted. Yeah, well, that's great. I've seen, I don't think I've seen the binoculars in person, but I've seen a photograph of them, which I think is... Uh... I think it's in a, a few places online, but beautiful, beautiful pair of binoculars. So uh, just a little bit more about the human history. Uh, any other notable personalities in the history of the keepers and families at Wood Island and or really notable uh, incidents related to the keepers over the years? And I'm sure I know there's multiple ones, but we <laughs> want to try to rein ourselves in a little bit here, maybe to one or two uh, things. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's it's hard to know what your definition of notable is, but I'll tell you right. a, a story that I've just recently discovered. That is that our first keeper, turns out that he was a privateer. Um, and one of, the, one of the chronicles of the period, a guy by the name of George Folsom wrote that this privateer named Benjamin Cole, um, he was his, his ships were outfitted and he makes a couple of comments but then he says that nothing really no, of note occurred during his privateering experience well i was in nova scotia this summer and it turns out that there is a privateering museum in liverpool and uh, benjamin cole made a raid there um, the raid it, indeed it didn't really amount to much he he captured the fort and a few people and then arrogantly um, wandered through town where he himself was captured and then the, they did an exchange of prisoners and all of the rest and the, the whole thing kind of went back to square one but to this day they have what they call privateer days in Liverpool Nova Scotia and that particular raid is celebrated there that's the right word for it celebrated from the point of view of the Nova Scotians I guess because nothing really of, of note uh, occurred as a result. Um, in, in our literature, though, this, this particular incident has kind of faded into history, and we didn't know very much about it. So um, I'm, I'm, I think that you know, I, it struck me as being particularly interesting that one of our privateers is being celebrated in Nova Scotia, and he, had, he was the guy who eventually became the lighthouse keeper and died out of Wood Island um, after just a year of service. There were plenty of, of um, heroic rescues and uh, so forth, and, and like you say, um, probably every one of those keepers deserves the, the, um, to be called notable in one sense or another. Sure. It would be hard to really separate out one or two, so. Let's yeah, leave it there. of course, if people want want more of those stories, more detail, they can get your book. That's exactly. <laughs> Which, yes. Thank yeah. you for the plug. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, there's there's so much and much more than we can talk about today. <laughs> Learn more 
more about Wood Island Light Station on their website at www.woodislandlighthouse.org. They also have a Facebook page. In part two next week, we'll talk about Wood Island's ghost stories, among many other things. Yeah, I just saw that the Wood Island Light Station came in fifth in a USA Today's reader poll of the best haunted destinations. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's definitely one of the things the light station is known for, no doubt about that. So we'll be talking also a lot about the uh, restoration of the light station, especially the Keeper's House. The interior of the Keeper's House is pretty incredible. Uh, when we went there, you got to see the work uh, that they've done in the house. What do you think about that, Sarah? I thought that was, I mean, among all the incredible things out there, one of the most interesting how you step into the lighthouse and you go back in time uh, you know, over a hundred years and every little detail is taken into consideration and all of the objects and, and everything in there, the furniture, um, pretty incredible. So I'm excited to talk about that in further detail. Yeah. Yeah. It's restored basically to the early 1900s and they, they've really done a good job. A reminder that uh, part two of our two-part uh, episodes on Wood Island Light Station, both the audio and video version, will be posted next Sunday, October 16th. As always, we want to thank all the volunteers, members, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Be sure to check out the Society's website at uslhs.org to learn more about tours, preservation grants, the research catalog, the passport program, and everything else the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers. Remember that donations and memberships help to support this podcast. If you listen with Apple Podcasts, be sure to rate and review us. So I have a main quote. The author E.B. White once wrote, quote, I would rather feel bad in Maine than feel good anywhere else, unquote. I've lived most of my life in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but I definitely have to agree with that quote. I love Maine. So as always to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thank you so much for listening and keep a good life. <laughs>